are. Realize I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Choice number one, admitting need, the reality choice. Part of our human nature is to refuse change until our pain exceeds our fear. Fear of change, that is. We simply deny the pain until it gets so bad that we are crushed and finally realize we need some help. Why don't we save ourselves a bit of misery and admit now what we're inevitably going to have to admit later? We are not God, and we desperately need God because our lives are unmanageable without Him. We'll be forced to learn that lesson someday. We may as well admit it now. If you answer yes to any of the questions below, you'll know without a doubt that you are a citizen of the human race. Do you ever stay up late when you know you need sleep? Do you ever eat or drink more calories than your body needs? Do you ever feel you ought to exercise, but don't? Do you ever know the right thing to do, but don't do it? Do you ever know something is wrong, but do it anyway? Have you ever known you should be unselfish, but were selfish instead? Have you ever tried to control somebody or something and found them or it uncontrollable? As fellow members of the human race, we all deal with life's hurts, hang-ups, and habits. In the next pages, we'll look at the cause of these hurts, hang-ups, and habits, their consequences, and their cure. As we look at the causes and consequences of our pain, our spiritual poverty will become obvious. How can we be happy about being spiritually poor, as the beatitude for this chapter tells us we will be? Admitting the truth that we are spiritually poor or powerless to control our tendency to do wrong leads us to this happiness and to the cure we so desperately need. The Cause of Our Problems The cause of our problems is our nature. No, not the trees, rocks, and lakes kind of nature, but our human nature, that is, our sin nature. The Bible tells us that this sin nature gets us into all kinds of problems. We choose to do things that aren't good for us, even when we know better. We respond in hurtful ways when we are hurt. We try to fix problems, and often in our attempts to fix them, we only make them worse. The Bible says it this way, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. This verse lets us know we can't trust our human nature to lead us out of our problems. Left on its own, our sin nature will tend to do wrong desire to be God, and try to play God. Number one, our tendency to do wrong. We will always have this sin nature, this tendency to do the wrong thing. In fact, we will wrestle with it as long as we are on this earth. Even if you have already asked Christ into your life, even after you become a Christian, you still have desires that pull you in the wrong direction. We find in the Bible that Paul understood this, for he struggled with his sin nature just as we do. I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. I know perfectly well that what I am doing is wrong, but I can't help myself 
because it is sin inside me that makes me do these evil things. Do Paul's words sound vaguely familiar to you? Sure they do. We end up doing what we don't want to do and not doing what we do want to do. For years, I thought I could control my drinking. I believed the lie that I could stop whenever I wanted. It really wasn't that bad. My choices were not hurting anybody. I was deep into my denial. As the pain of my sin addiction got worse, I would try to stop on my own power. I was able to stop for a day, a week, or even a few months, but I would always start drinking again. I wanted to do what was right, but on my own, I was powerless to change. Number two, our desire to be God. Why do we continue making poor choices? Why do we repeat the same mistakes? At the root of our human tendency to do wrong is our desire to be in control. We want to decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. We want to make our own choices, call our own shots, make our own rules. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. In essence, we want to be God. But this is nothing new. Trying to be God is humankind's oldest problem. In Genesis 3, even Adam and Eve tried to be in control. God put them in paradise, and they tried to control paradise. God told them, you can do anything you want in paradise except one thing. Don't eat from this one tree. What did they do? You got it. They made a beeline for the forbidden tree. The only thing in paradise God said was off limits. Satan said, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. And they wanted to be God. That's been our problem from the very start of humanity. Today, we still want to be God. Number three, our attempts to play God. We play God by denying our humanity and by trying to control everything for our own selfish reasons. We attempt to be the center of our own universe. We play God by trying to control our image, other people, our problems, and our pain. We try to control our image. We care so much about what other people think of us. We don't want them to know what we're really like. We play games. We wear masks. We pretend. We fake it. We want people to see certain sides of us while we hide others. We deny our weaknesses and we deny our feelings. I'm not angry. I'm not upset. I'm not worried. I'm not afraid. We don't want people to see the real us. Why are we afraid to tell people who we are? The answer is, if I tell you who I really am and you don't like me, I'm in trouble because then I'm all I've got. We try to control other people. Parents try to control kids. Kids try to control parents. Wives try to control husbands. Husbands try to control wives. Co-workers vie for office control. People try to control other people. And along the way, we develop a lot of tools to manipulate each other. Everyone has his or her preferred methods. Some use guilt and shame. Some use praise and affirmation. Others use anger, fear, or an old favorite, the silent treatment. All in efforts to gain control. We try to control our problems. I can handle it, we say. It's not really a problem. I'm okay, really. I'm fine. 
Those are the words of somebody trying to play God. When we try to control our problems, we say, I don't need any help, and I certainly don't need counseling or recovery. I can quit any time. I'll work it out on my own power. When a TV repairman was asked about the worst kind of damage he'd ever seen to a television set, he said, The kind that results from people trying to fix their TVs on their own. The more we try to fix our problems by ourselves, the worse our problems get. We try to control our pain. Have you ever thought about how much time and effort you spend running from pain? Trying to avoid it, deny it, escape it, reduce it, or postpone it. Some of us try to avoid pain by eating or not eating. Others try to postpone it by getting drunk, smoking, taking drugs, or abusing prescription medications. Some try to escape through sports, traveling, or jumping in and out of relationships. Others withdraw into a hole and build a protective wall of depression around themselves. Still others become angry, abusive, critical, and judgmental. We'll try almost anything to control our pain. But the real pain comes when we realize, in our quieter moments, that no matter how hard we try, we're not in control. That realization can be very scary. Agreeing with God that He's God and we're not leads us into our first healing choice. Choice one, admitting need. Realize I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. The first step is always the hardest, and this first choice is no exception. Until you are willing to admit your need and recognize that you are not God, you will continue to suffer the consequences of your poor choices. As the Beatitude says, Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Admitting your need is what being spiritually poor is all about. The Consequences of Our Problems If the cause of most of our problems is our efforts to control everything, then what are the consequences of playing God? There are four. Number one, fear. When we try to control everything, we become afraid. Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. We are afraid somebody will find out who we really are, that we are fakes and phonies, that we really don't have it all together, that we're not perfect. We don't let anybody get close to us because they'll find out that we're scared inside, and so we fake it. We live in fear, afraid someone will reject us, not love us, or not like us when they know what we are really like. We believe they will only like the image we work to present. So we are afraid. Number two, frustration. Trying to be the general manager of the universe is frustrating. Have you ever been to Chuck E. Cheese's? They have this game called Whack-A-Mole. You use a big mallet to beat down these little moles that keep popping up. But when you whack one, three more pop up. You whack those and five more pop up. That machine is a parable of life. We whack down one relational conflict and another pops up. We whack down one addiction or compulsion and another one pops up. It's frustrating because we can't get them all knocked down at the same time. We walk around pretending we're God. I'm powerful. 
I can handle it. But if we're really in control, why don't we just unplug the machine? The Apostle Paul felt this same frustration. It seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. There is something else deep within me that is at war with my mind and wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin. David felt it too. My dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. Frustration is a symptom of a much deeper issue, a failure to acknowledge that we are not God. God's power is infinite, and our power is finite to the core. Number three, fatigue. Playing God makes us tired. Pretending we've got it all together is hard work. David experienced the fatigue of pretending. My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. Denial requires enormous amounts of emotional energy. Energy that could be used in problem solving is actually diverted into problem denying problem hiding, and problem avoiding. Most of us try to run from the pain by keeping busy. We think, I don't like the way I feel when I slow down. I don't like the sounds that go through my mind when I lay my head back on the pillow. If I just keep busy, maybe I can block out those feelings and drown out the sounds. We run from pain by constantly being on the go. We work ourselves to death. Or we get involved in some hobby or sport until it becomes a compulsion. We're on the golf course or tennis court or somewhere all the time. Even over-involvement in religious activities can be an attempt to hide our pain. We say, look at me. Look at all the ways I'm serving God. God does want you to serve Him out of love and purpose. He does not want you to use serving Him or the church to escape your pain. If you're in a constant state of fatigue, always worn out, ask yourself, what pain am I running from? What problem am I afraid to face? What am I trying to hide? What motivates and drives me to work and work so that I'm in a constant state of fatigue? Number four, failure. Playing God is one job where failure is guaranteed. You're not big enough. The wisdom of Proverbs tells us, You will never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins. Confess them and give them up, then God will show mercy to you. We need to be honest and open about our weaknesses, faults, and failures. The Cure for Our Problems The cure for our problems come in a strange form. It comes through admitting weakness and through a humble heart. Admitting Weakness The Bible says that in admitting my weakness, I actually find strength. I just let Christ take over, and so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. This is not a popular idea in our self-sufficient American culture that says, raise yourself up by your own bootstraps. Don't depend on anybody else. Do the Lone Ranger thing be the strong, silent type. The Bible also says that knowing we are spiritually poor will make us happy. This is the first step to getting your act together. You must admit that you're powerless to do it on your own, that you are spiritually poor, that you need other people and you need God. 
Making the first choice to healing means acknowledging that you are not God. Doing so means recognizing and admitting three important facts of life. Number one, I admit that I am powerless to change my past. It hurt. I still remember the pain. But all the resentment and shame in the world isn't going to change what happened. I'm powerless to change my past. Number two, I admit that I am powerless to control other people. I try to control others. I actually like manipulating them. I use all kinds of little gimmicks, but it doesn't work. I am responsible for my actions, not theirs. I can't control other people. Number three. I admit that I am powerless to cope with my harmful habits, behaviors, and actions. Good intentions don't cut it. Willpower is not enough. I need something more. I need a source of power beyond myself. I need God because He made me to need Him. A humble heart. A second portion of our cure is having a humble heart. God cannot work His change if our hearts are filled with pride. The Bible tells us that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God's grace has the power to heal us, enabling us to change. Even after all we've talked about in this chapter, it's still difficult for us to admit our need. Our pride continues to insist that we can do it alone. Some of us may still be thinking, I can do this on my own. I can solve my own problems. No, you can't. If you could, you would have already done so. But since you can't, you won't. What needs changing in your life? What hurt or hang-up or habit have you been trying to ignore? Choosing to admit that you can't do it alone and that you need God is the first and hardest choice. It's hard to admit, I have a problem and I need help. Admitting we have a problem and giving it a name is humbling. Doing it says, I'm not God and I don't have it as together as I'd like everybody to think. If you admit that truth to someone else, he or she will not be surprised. Others know it, God knows it, and you know it. You just need to admit it. Stop right now and name the hurt, hang-up, or habit you've been trying to ignore. Then admit to God that you are powerless to manage your life on your own. Congratulations! You've made the first choice on the road to healing. Admitting that you have a hurt, hang-up, or habit is just the beginning. To implement this first choice, as well as the seven choices to come, you need to take three actions. Number one, pray about it, number two, write about it, and number three, share about it. Working through these action steps is where the real work gets done. This is where the change happens. Some of you may be tempted to skip this part and just move on to the next chapter. Don't do it. These three interactive steps found at the end of every chapter are your pathway to healing, make the first choice. Make the choice. Action number one, pray about it. Ask God to give you the courage to admit your inability to control yourself or your world. Pray that you will begin to depend on His power to help you make positive changes. Ask God to take control of your life and help you stop trying to control your image, other people, your problems, and your pain. 
Let him know you are weary of carrying the fear, the frustration, the fatigue, and the failures of trying to be the general manager of the universe. If you do not know all the words to pray and say to God right now, don't worry. You can pray as David did. God, please hurry to my rescue. God, come quickly to my side. Or you can pray with me. Dear God, I want to take the first choice to healing and spiritual health today. I realize I am not you, God. I've often tried to control my problems, my pain, my image, and even other people, as if I were you. I'm sorry. I've tried to deny my problems by staying busy and keeping myself distracted. But I want to stop running. I admit that I am helpless to control this tendency to do things I know are unhealthy for me. Today I am asking for your help. I humbly ask you to take all the pieces of my unmanageable life and begin the process of healing. Please heal me. Please give me the strength to choose health. Help me stick with this pro process for next seven choices. In your name I pray. Amen. God will hear your cry for help and is ready to provide you with his strength, power, perfect love, and complete forgiveness as you choose to take your first step to healing. Action number two. Write about it. As you begin your journey through the eight healing choices, it is important to write down your thoughts and insights. As God frees you from your hurts, hang-ups, and habits, He will reveal significant insights about yourself and others. Keep a daily journal of what God shows you and the progress and growth you are making day by day. Use the Life's Healing Choices Journal, a spiral notebook, or whatever works for you. Just a word of caution. Keep your journal in a safe place. What you write in your journal are your private thoughts. As we continue through the eight choices, you will learn when and with whom to share your journal notes. The following questions will help you get started writing. Number one, what people, places, or things do you have the power to control? Number two, what people, places, or things have you been attempting to control and be specific? Number three, describe how you tried to control your image, other people, your problems, and your pain. Number four, write down how the fear, frustration, fatigue, and failures of trying to be the general manager of the universe has affected your relationships with God and others. Number five, what specific hurts, hang-ups, or habits have you been denying? Writing down the answers to these five questions was not easy, but it was a major beginning in your healing process. Now let's look at the third action. Action number three. Share about it. As you move through the eight healing choices, you will discover that you need to share the life-changing tr truths God is showing you with someone you trust. The wise writer of Ecclesiastes said, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. The next few chapters will guide you in choosing this person. You'll be looking for someone you can honestly and openly talk to. This person needs to be non-judgmental and someone with whom you can safely share your personal journal notes. 
This person should be willing to share his or her life and struggles with you as well. Once God shows you that safe person, set up a meeting time and ask him or her to join with you in this recovery journey toward healing by being your accountability partner. This person may be a relative, a friend, a neighbor, a co worker. Someone in your small group or someone in your church family. Be sure the person you choose is of the same sex. You will be sharing very personal details of your life as you go through each of the healing choices. Some of the issues will be inappropriate to share with someone of the opposite sex. As you work through the next few chapters, If you cannot find a safe person to share with, visit www.celebraterecovery.com to locate a Celebrate Recovery group near you. There, you will find people who have worked through the eight choices and who will be glad to help and support you as you begin your healing journey. Just remember, This journey should not be traveled alone. You need others to listen to you, encourage you, support you, and demonstrate God's love to you. If you choose to begin this journey, God will be faithful in giving you spiritual health and freedom from your life's hurts, hang ups, and habits. Stories of Changed Lives A little background. At Saddleback Church, we are committed to being a safe place, a place where people can talk about and deal with real problems, real hurts, real hang ups, and real habits, without being blown away by judgmental opinions. We are a family of fellow strugglers. There is not a person in our church who has it all together. We are all weak in different areas and we all need each other. One of our most effective ministries at Saddleback is called Celebrate Recovery. This group is made up of hundreds of men and women dealing with all kinds of hurts, hang ups, and habits. They all work together on the eight Christ centered healing choices described in this book. At Celebrate Recovery, they are called the Eight Principles. At the conclusion of each chapter, you'll find two personal stories testimonies from real people in Celebrate Recovery who have chosen to overcome their hurts, hang ups, and habits through God's power. These courageous individuals come from very different backgrounds. With a variety of problems and issues. As you read their stories, please keep your heart and mind open. You will see how their journey relates to your own life or to someone's close to you. Marnie's Story I wish I could start this story with Once Upon a Time or There Once Was a Little Girl. But instead, it starts with a broken home, torturous abuse, fits of rage, and those I held dearest to my heart stripped away from me. These are just some of the catalysts that led to my sinful lifestyle filled with pornography, sex, and lust. My name is Marnie, and I'm a grateful believer who struggles with sexual addiction and anorexia. My path to recovery started at Saddleback Church in November of 2000. I remember that night well. I crawled into the church building, broken and unaware of my reality. My view on life had become so distorted and my actions so out of control that I don't think the enemy himself could have kept up with me. I arrived an hour early. Unaware that the worship service didn't start until seven o'clock. 
I remember sitting there listening to the band rehearse while a handful of people walked around and set things up. Tears began to form in my eyes as I looked around, and I struggled to blink them back. I didn't know what I was doing there. Everything within me wanted to get up and walk out. I was still in denial. The same thoughts repeated in my head. Whatever is wrong with these people is way worse than anything I could have done. And whatever I've done, I'm sure I can fix it on my own. But for some reason, I could not bring myself to get up out of that chair and leave. I was startled when a man came up to me, put his hand on my shoulder and said, Excuse me, but this seat is taken. As I looked around the empty room, it took me a moment to realize that he was kidding. Despite my confusion, I found comfort in his words. I felt welcomed and a little less out of place. That night happened to be the ninth anniversary of Celebrate Recovery. I watched as people started coming into the room, smiling, hugging, and celebrating. After a brief worship service, I attended Newcomers 101, where I confessed my secrets for the first time. The woman who led 101 that night came and sat beside me, cupped my hands in hers, and told me, Everything's going to be okay. You've come to the right place. Though I must admit I was a bit skeptical, that was exactly what I needed to hear. Long before I was born, my family was plagued with turmoil. My parents divorced before my first birthday, and after they separated, they sent my older sister and me to live with my father and grandparents in Hawaii. My father was absent most of the time, so my grandparents were unofficially assigned to care for us. My fondest childhood memories are of the years I spent with my grandparents in Hawaii. They taught me about Jesus, and by their example I learned Christian values. Thankfully, they showed me what it was like to live in a normal family. My parents, on the other hand, were the opposites of my grandparents. My father was a functioning alcoholic, and his negligence negligence as a parent allowed me more freedom than what was good for me. I remember crouching in a corner with my sister, trying to smoke some of my dad's cigarettes and drink some of his beer. One day, while snooping around the house, I found my dad's Playboy collection hidden in his dresser drawers. I felt as though I had just stumbled onto a secret, and I ran out of the room. At the same time, I was intrigued by the Playboy images. When I was five or six, I moved back to California to live with my mother. She was physically, verbally, and emotionally abusive. I vividly remember walking in on my room, my mom, during one of her fits of rage. She slapped me in the face so hard, my tooth punctured my lip. I had a huge fat lip and black eye the following day. I told everyone I was eating and my fork slipped. My mom would always apologize and say she hated what she had done, but in the next breath, she'd tell me, I deserved it. Sometimes I'd have to go to the hospital. I remember the doctor sending my mother out of the room and asking, Did your mother hit you? With a stoic face, my response was always a simple shake of the head. No. Throughout my childhood, I was my mother's human piñata. She would choke me and throw objects at me daily. I was beaten with lamps, hangers, and high-heeled shoes. To cope, I escaped into a fantasy life filled with lustful thoughts and pornographic images. I would stay in bed for hours fantasizing about sexual acts, 
replaying the same dreams again and again in my head. A seemingly endless amount of turmoil filled my upbringing. I had to escape the insanity I was living in. So when I turned 17, just before the start of my senior year of high school, I emancipated myself. I moved out and was on my own. I was determined to break the cycle of dysfunction I'd lived in all my life. But as it turns out, I had become a product of my environment. I married my high school sweetheart in June of 1998. Marriage started off difficult for us. Although we dated for eight years before getting married, as soon as we got married, it seemed that, in an instant, we were miles apart. Our conversations became superficial. We struggled financially and we lived with his parents. The enemy sank his fangs into me as I viewed my marriage as a mistake. Bitterness, resentment, and anger started to paint an ugly picture as my visions of a normal lifestyle fell by the wayside. We went through months of arguments and broken promises. I felt like I was running in place. I felt like I had no voice and no control. Most of all, I felt emotionally bankrupt. My addictive lifestyle started to take shape when I took a new position at work that required me to travel often. All of this free time away from my husband gave me the freedom to make my own choices, which led to unhealthy behaviors. In my denial, life never felt so good. I was getting attention from men I hardly knew. I began to punish myself for these behaviors by starving my body, both spiritually and physically. Body image became of the utmost importance to me. I put myself on a rigid diet consisting of a handful of grapes each day and excessive amounts of Diet Coke. I started working out obsessively, running between 12 and 15 miles a day. This lifestyle, coupled with my sexual addiction, left my body weak and out of fuel. I weighed a mere 92 pounds. My face was sunken and my skin gaunt. I was rapidly self-destructing. My addiction was now in full throttle. I became more independent of my marriage every day. I felt in control. I was finally doing something I thought I wanted to do instead of having to live by someone else's rules. But in my heart, I knew something was desperately wrong. I struggled with confusion about the Christian values I learned as a child versus what the world views as socially acceptable behavior. I suddenly felt as if I only knew these childhood beliefs intellectually and my relationship with the Lord was non-existent. I ignored thoughts about God and replaced them with alcohol, anorexia, and adultery. I was on a suicide mission devoted to a life of deception. My life mirrored the very women I had been warned against in my childhood Bible lessons. Jezebel, Potiphar's wife, and Delilah. Yes, Delilah. My life had become a reflection of this woman whose greatest accomplishment in life was destroying the man who loved her most. As a child, I had a lot of practice pretending all was well. So I'd walk into work with a smile on my face, balanced, poised, and professional. Then I would walk into my office, shut the door, and act out with internet pornography and chat rooms. When with my colleague, college friends, I played the innocent, codependent Marnie, the good girl. The Marnie who never drank, but took care of the rest of the bunch when they did. 
And believe it or not, I was still going to church. At church, I was the devout Christian, pseudo-listening from a concrete bench outside of the worship center, making sure my friends and family knew I was present and accounted for. But the real Marnie, the uninhibited Marnie, surfaced after work hours. I would spend most of my free time at bars with the good old boys club. I could tell a good dirty joke with the rest of them. The more I drank, the more I talked. The more I talked, the more I blamed my circumstances for my behavior. I had a completely cavalier disregard and disrespect for myself and for those around me. I didn't know how to resolve these conflicting pieces of my past. The pain had finally become greater than the fear. I had reached my bottom. As I watched the scenes of my life unfold, I became desperate to find freedom from my life of lies. I picked up the phone and called Saddleback Church. They suggested I try Celebrate Recovery, and I finally did. During those first few weeks, I began to recall the Christian values taught to me as a child by my grandparents, which I had buried because of my anger and resentment toward God. But he now had my attention, and I began to realize the truth of this scripture passage. I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I can't. I do what I don't want to, what I hate. I know perfectly well that what I am doing is wrong, and my bad conscience proves that I agree with these laws I am breaking, but I can't help myself because I'm no longer doing it. It is sin inside me that is stronger than I am that makes me do these evil things. Two months after that first night at Celebrate Recovery, a women's step study opened. I picked up a Bible and a set of Celebrate Recovery participant guides and began a pilgrimage through the eight steps. I found women I could relate to and who could also relate to me. At first, I kept myself at a safe distance. I still guarded my secrets so no one could use what they knew to hurt me. I also felt hideously ugly and I thought the scars on my heart and soul were visible to everyone. When I finally shared for the first time, I saw women who listened without judgment. I began to understand that the pains of my past played an important part in my behavior and that I was in a cycle of addiction. All my life I had viewed men as objects and had been living out what I had experienced in my childhood. I had kept so many secrets. Saying them out loud brought truth to my reality. I found comfort in the fact that I could not be perfect. Most important, I saw how far away from my relationship with Christ I had fallen. Problems far too big for me to solve are piled higher than my head. Meanwhile, my sins, too many to count, have all caught up with me, and I am ashamed to look up. I began exploring uncharted territory at Celebrate Recovery. It was after working Principle 4 where I openly examined and confessed my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust that true healing began. It was then I heard God's promise of freedom and stopped acting out. It was then that I realized that whatever is covered up will be uncovered and every secret will be made known. So then, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in broad daylight. As I laid my sins at the foot of the cross and turned from my addictions, God declared me not guilty. He blotted out the charges proved against you, the list of his commandments which you had not obeyed. 
He took this list of sins and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. I have reconciled my relationship with my husband, and today we have a beautiful marriage built on honesty and trust. The challenges are still there. Marriage takes work, and my view on marriage is that every couple needs to argue now and then just to prove the relationship is strong enough to survive. We are blessed with the most precious gifts of all, two beautiful girls. My new ministry in life is my family. Where they once played second fiddle to my work and my addictive behavior, they are now my priority. As for my mother, I have found it in my heart to forgive her. I still do not have a relationship with her, even though attempts have been made throughout the years. I remain steadfast in the fact that she is not a safe person. My dad has since passed away, but we were privileged to create an amazing ending to our story before he passed. Nine months before he died, I went back to where my life with him began, Hawaii. It was the first time we had seen each other in 15 years. We made our amends, but most important, he met his granddaughters for the first time. From that moment on, it was like no time at all had passed. I look back at the time we spent not talking to each other and I think, what a waste of 15 years. I wish I'd had had more time with him in the end. But God gave me those last nine months, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. Had we not taken that leap of faith to mend our relationship, I would be grieving his death very differently today. Thankfully, my last moments with my dad are joyful memories. Reflecting on my life now, I thank God for his never failing truth and understanding. I look back at the journey I had to take through Celebrate Recovery to bring balance to the chaos of my life. I use the tools I learned in CR daily, and I continue my obedience to Christ to live out my life as a wife, mother, and employee. There was a season of my life when the world made no sense. My allegiance lay in the success of my betrayals and the comfort of my sin. Today, God has taken my tragedy and used it as a testament of my faith. I thank God that, unlike Delilah, my life has not been wasted. God chose to spare me, and I'm no longer defined by my past mistakes and failures. It's only by God's grace that when I look at myself in the mirror today, I no longer see an adulterer, an alcoholic, or an anorexic. I see myself as an incredibly blessed mother, wife, and forgiven child of God. I've learned how to embrace pain and make the choice to abandon the life of deception and destruction. Remember when I talked about traveling every week without my husband, finding myself in compromising situations, and how my addictions were born out of those situations? Ironically, the pattern of traveling that almost destroyed my life is now being used by God to restore me to wholeness. Today I get to serve as the Celebrate Recovery Conference Director. And it is my privilege to travel every other week to help coordinate Celebrate Recovery one-day seminars and summits. My accountability team spans across the nation as I have filled my life with godly women and men from whom I seek guidance every day. And trust me, with an accountability partner in almost every state, there's no hiding anymore. I am reminded of God's promise in Deuteronomy. Even though you are at the ends of the earth, 
the Lord your God will go and find you and bring you back again. The scripture below has become one of my life verses. There was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner was, but my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. All day and all night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess them to you, Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Drew's Story My name is Drew, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus who struggles with addiction and codependency. My parents were both raised by parents who were hardworking, salt-of-the-earth types, who were familiar with heavy-handed discipline. Drinking was not just social in their families, it was a part of the day-to-day -day landscape of everyone's life. Shame and guilt, verbal and emotional abuse, and physical intimidation were all part of their parents' parental discipline toolbox. While it may not have been their wish to pass along such methods, it's true that hurting people hurt other people in the way they were hurt. And so I experienced a good number of those devices in my upbringing. Though I do have many fond memories from my childhood, my dad's upbringing left him an emotionally hardened perfectionist. Affirmation was non-existent. Insults, put-downs, and constant reminders that I couldn't do anything right, that I wouldn't succeed, and that I would never amount to anything, were normal messages I received in my life. The constant rehearsal of these reminders left me feeling insignificant, inadequate, incapable, and unloved. The result, I felt alone and on the outside in my family and with my peers. Like most children, I desperately wanted the approval of my parents. It became my goal to prove to them I was worthy of it. However, all my efforts failed, regardless of how hard I tried or what I accomplished. Even so, I continually tried to gain their approval, only to be met with disappointment. This happened over and over throughout my teen years and well into my adulthood. I frantically searched to find someone, anyone, to validate me. I was willing to do anything just to fit in somewhere and feel accepted. Medicating my emotional pain was easy with drugs. I drank a little, but didn't like the hangovers, so I thought drugs were a perfect fit. At a young age, I also turned to sex. Being involved with someone gave me a certain sense of power because in the moment I felt accepted and loved. However, I failed to see that it was too just an illusion. It was simply another way to medicate myself. I did do some positive things in my teen years that you would think should have worked in my favor. I was in drama and had a good paying drama job at the local grocery store, which allowed me to buy a brand new sports car while still in high school. My job also provided me with an abundance of spending money. I used the money to buy friends and impress my high school girlfriends. Rather than encouraging confidence, however, my pursuits only bred arrogance. Sadly, I can remember one of my teachers asking what I was going to do after college. I smugly replied, Why would I want to go to college to be like you? I make more money than you and I'm still in high school. Arrogance has its price. As I barely graduated from high school 
and had alienated some of the most caring people I had ever known. At age 19, I met my wife, Robin. She, too, lived with false messages. While we hit it off pretty good, the foundation of our relationship was largely meeting each other's needs in unhealthy ways. By the third year of our marriage, I had done just about everything I could to destroy our relationship. My drug use increased. I was unfaithful and made it clear to her that she could never reach my expectations. Does that sound familiar? Truly hurting people do hurt others the way they were hurt. It was also now that I began mixing as many different kinds of drugs as I could in order to get a bigger and better high. The result was unconsciousness and admission to a psychiatric hospital. I remember waking up in a dimly lit room. I couldn't move and felt drool running down the corner of my mouth. I think this was the first time I began to realize I was powerless. As I opened my eyes and struggled to focus, I could make out the outline of someone standing over me inquiring, Why are you here? I tried to respond, but could only make gurgling sounds. Oh, they must have hit you up with Thorazine or Loxetane, the person said. You won't be able to move for a couple of days, but eventually it'll wear off. My name's Tom, he continued. I'm in here for sexual issues. It occurred to me that the person speaking was not a doctor, but another patient whose level of sanity was completely unknown to me. I had no ability to respond, defend myself, or even cry out for help should the person behind the strange voice mean me harm. I finally realized... Drew, your life is unmanageable. That moment was sobering, but my struggle to stay in control of my life was far from over. Following my wake-up call in the psychiatric hospital, I experienced about a year of sobriety from drugs. Then I started telling myself all the lies that addicts do. I can do it once in a while, and I won't get hooked again. I'll just keep it limited to pot, and so on. After only a month, I was right back where I was the year before. I was getting wasted first thing in the morning, at lunch, on the way home from work, and all night long. I was mixing as many drugs as I could to achieve a bigger and better high. A deep sense of hopelessness returned. I knew I was back on the path to self-destruction. Romans 2 verse 4 states, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? God had been revealing Himself to me for some time but it had been easy up till then to ignore his voice. I finally decided to pray one of those prayers God loves to hear. God, if you're really there, show me what is wrong in my life. In that moment, my selfishness, addictions, inability to love, and all the damage I had done became clear. I saw myself nailing Jesus to the cross one hand at a time, then his feet. Then I saw myself standing in front of the cross, laughing at Jesus as he hung to die. In that moment, the words I heard in my heart were almost audible. Drew, if you love me, you'll obey me. I understood then the cost of my actions was the torturous death Jesus experienced on the cross. I realized God's patience and love for me. 
His invitation to enter into relationship with him became clear. I no longer wanted to be a crucifier. I understood I needed to make a choice over who was going to be in control of my life. I so wanted to make that choice. As I sat in the presence of God, I couldn't help but be honest with Him. I realized just how powerless I was. I loved my sin, the drugs, the porn, and acting out sexually. I confessed to the Lord that I wished it wasn't so. I knew I loved these choices more than anything else, including Him. Change my heart, O God, I cried. Take away my affection for my sin and replace it with a devoted love for you. After praying that prayer, I could feel a deep sense of peace. I understood that God wasn't asking me to measure up to find favor with Him through an act of my own will. He had been waiting for me to invite Him into my life to do the impossible. He wanted to do something for me, in me, and through me, that I could not do for myself. In that moment, something very supernatural happened to me. I felt my affection for drugs leave my body. This year, I'm experiencing 35 years of recovery over drugs. Dealing with my drug problem was only the beginning. God intended to show me that not only did He love me, but that I could trust Him. He put His finger on my marriage and convicted me of the need to come clean and make amends with my wife about my affair. I argued with God that she would leave. He told me to trust Him. What made this hard was remembering that she had been sexually abused in her past. I knew my actions would only confirm every fear she ever had about men. They can't be trusted. There's no good way to break someone's heart. I remember having a moment where we were happy and laughing and then soberly changing the subject and confessing my sin to her. As I did, her expression changed from contentment and joy to incredible pain and betrayal. It was like watching a precious piece of crystal shatter in my arms. It was not an easy process of restoration. God needed to do something for us, in us, and through us that we just could not do for ourselves. Although I was truly repentant and wanted to be the man she deserved, she had to rely on God to help her overcome her anger and fear and replace it with forgiveness and trust. I am so thankful she did. I know I didn't deserve her forgiveness or trust. Through her forgiveness, I received an understanding of what it means to experience grace beyond measure. God again showed himself to be faithful as this year we are celebrating 38 years of marriage. However, God was not done yet. He started showing me that He created me with unique design and purpose. The Bible tells us, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. For years, the messages of inadequacy I carried made it difficult for me to believe that I had the ability to succeed. Regardless of how much I did or achieved, all I felt was rejection and put-downs. One of the greatest sources of these feelings was that I had chosen not to go to college. The words I had spoken to my teachers long ago had come back to haunt me. While I was in the grocery business, I was told that I wouldn't be considered for the store manager's training program because I didn't have a college education. Yet despite that, the company had the college graduates train under me due to their lack of experience. After 14 years in grocery, 
God provided an opportunity for us to work in full-time ministry in a Christian residential group home for at-risk teenage boys. Finally, I was getting a chance to work with God's people. Surely, I won't have to worry about put-downs and trying to prove myself, I thought. It didn't take long to realize this was a fallacy. At a staff meeting, I shared a thought about a treatment plan for one of our boys. Someone commented, That may sound like a really good idea, but you don't have any formal training or college. Instantly invalidated, I had enough. I'm going to show them, I thought. Since I've never done things halfway, I decided to go back to school to pursue a PhD in psychology. I knew getting accepted into grad school meant I would need to get almost perfect grades in college and get research experience. The fact that I'd never cared about grades in high school haunted me. However, I was a man on a mission. I treated school like a business. I was completely focused. The first quarter, I received the first 4.0 GPA ever in my life. Semester after semester, I continued to to duplicate my success for the next four years. During the last quarter of my senior year, while working on my thesis, I survived on less than four hours of sleep a night. Each morning, I left home at 4.30 for the 75-mile drive over a mountain pass to school. God showed me tremendous favor through college. I got near-perfect grades and, co- and completed the research necessary to move forward. I won the President's Medallion for the highest grade point average in the School of Sciences. I say this not to brag, but simply to testify of God's abundant grace. It's amazing how God will allow us to have our way, only to show us His ways are higher than ours. The last week of my senior year, the sun was breaking over the pass during my early morning drive. I saw an 18-wheel truck swerving wildly all over the road, heading right for me. Eventually, he straightened up. I noticed he had hit a deer. The deer was completely crushed from the back hindquarter with its entrails hanging out. Yet surprisingly, it was still alive and desperately tried to crawl off the road. It was only a short way up the road when God began to speak with me. Did you see that deer back there? That was you. You believe that by getting the grades, doing the research, and showing everyone they were wrong, you're going to be okay. But you are dead and don't even know it. Wow, that smarted. The truth can set you free, but it sure can hurt first. Why did God say that to me? Didn't he know that I was going to have to defend my thesis in a few hours and take my first final? What's with that? The rest of the trip to school, all I could think about was that deer and me, both dead and not even knowing it. Shaken and rattled, I went to my counseling professor and shared what had happened. As I did, he asked, So what's really the matter? I told you, I said, and repeated what I had seen. He repeated himself, So what's really the matter? It was clear he wasn't going to let me off the hook and that he was looking for me to get honest with him and myself. Eventually, I burst into uncontrollable sobbing and finally admitted that I had spent my entire life trying to get the approval of others, particularly particularly my parents. Again, I began to realize just how powerless I was over my hurts and how much they controlled me. And even though I was in perfect position to pursue a Ph.D., I also realized with perfect clarity that it wasn't God's plan or purpose for my life. I knew long ago that he wired me to be a pastor. It was as if the Lord let me pursue what I wanted 
just to show me it wouldn't fit that hole in my identity. God showed me that it could only be filled by truly understanding who I was in Him and His purpose for my life. Over the next 10 years, I learned to keep good boundaries with my parents. However, I still held on to bitterness toward my father for never giving me the affirmation and approval I believed I deserved. Eventually, after becoming involved in a Celebrate Recovery program at our church, one of my trusted accountability partners challenged me that I needed to ask my God for forgiveness for the bitterness I was holding on to. At first, I was indignant. But God showed me there was still unfinished business that needed to be dealt with. The Lord helped me to realize that because of the brokenness in my dad's upbringing, he himself had never experienced affirmation. I was expecting him to give me something he simply did not possess. Much like expecting someone who had been blind his whole life to describe the color green. God not only prompted me to ask for his forgiveness, but also to pour out affirmation over him in ways that he had never experienced. I let him know just how much God himself loved him. As I shared my amends, my dad was speechless. It was as if he had new understanding of, what, of his own existence. He was finally free of the messages he was carrying during his lifetime. Our relationship completely changed on that day. Today, we are extremely close. After having spent the better part of the last 30 years in full-time ministry, I am totally amazed by just how much God has blessed me. Previously, I was powerless over the sin that held me in bondage and was living without purpose. The Lord has now set me free to fully understand the meaning of Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. In the past, I would do anything and everything to feel good about myself. I've come to realize that without Christ, it was impossible for me to find relief from the deep-rooted feelings of inadequacy and lack of purpose I lived with. Now, through my relationship with Jesus, I truly know who I am and why I exist. Thank you for letting me share. It is my prayer that the honesty and openness of Marnie and Drew help you to consider the hurts, hang-ups, or habits in your own life and how you can make choice number one. Realize I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Once you make this choice, your life's healing journey can begin.